Today we're going to talk about why ankle injuries are among the most common traumas incurred during sporting activities. We'll have a chat to Dr. Peter Francis, a world-renowned sports and exercise scientist who specializes in biomechanics and sports rehabilitation to get his insights on the matter. We'll then cover all the things one has to do to strengthen one's ankles, including exercises you can do in the comfort of your own home using a simple plank of wood and some PVC pipe. So stay tuned to the end because this is going to be both an educational and a practical video. A literature review of 227 studies across 70 different sports in 38 countries found the ankle joint to be the second most common injury site after the knee and the ankle sprain to be the most common type of ankle injury. It has also been found that once an ankle sprain occurs, it is more likely to reoccur and that 20 to 50% of sufferers will end up with functional ankle instability, which is just a fancy way of saying weak and unreliable ankles for athletic activities. Now, to tackle this problem effectively, we have to first identify the common causes of ankle sprains and then find the solutions to them. The best way to start is to ask one of the world's experts on these issues. So that's what we did by interviewing Dr. Peter Francis. In his 2020 paper published in the British Medical Journal of Sports and Exercise Medicine, Dr. Francis mentions how due to the rapid advancements in the way we have lived over the past 100 years, there is now a huge mismatch between cultural and evolutionary biology. If you want to read his full article, you can find it referenced in the blog version of this video, which is linked in the description. In our podcast with Dr. Francis, we asked him to elaborate on this issue and to explain how it can cause lower limb injuries like ankle sprains. Running is a sport very low on movement variability. And, and what I mean by that is the running we do now. Again, if we were in a hunter-gatherer situation, we would have pace variation, but we would also have regular surface variation. The amount of variability we're exposed to is a challenge. So if we think about the interior of a shoe, it's very regular. Um, it's very low on variability, you could say. And if we think about a, a pavement or a road, it's also very regular. The mismatch is sort of like we've got this foot that was engineered and designed with all of these bones and joints that is able to be both stiff and flexible depending on how that terrain is changing underneath our foot. And we then put that into a very regular interior on very regular ground. So now you have a structure that's designed for accomplishing a task, which is running, using multiple different strategies, now only able to accomplish the task using one strategy. So it's like we're, we're sort of confining um, and reducing the number of variables all the time. And I think variability is an interesting subject in general, because if you look at variability across all diseases, you know, heart rate variability and so on. When, when that window gets too narrow, we, we get into disease states um, quite easily. So it seems that in our diet and in our footwear and in our exercise habits, uh, variability more often than not is quite good for us. I, I guess even the fact that humans have, have, have thrived is, is, is down to genetic variability. So I think, I think the more variability you remove, the, the sicker the the human becomes, you know. So there are three important points that Dr. Francis made here. Firstly, the human body is made to move in a variety of different ways. So when you isolate your activity and are hyper-focused on one specific sport, like road running, for example, then you overwork one dimension of the body. This not only increases your risk of developing overuse injuries, but it also leaves your body ill-prepared for any unknown territory. So let's say you try a different sport that involves a lot of rapid changing of direction and speed variation with a bit of jumping, like basketball. Well, your lungs may hold up, but I can't make the same predictions for your ankles. Furthermore, there is a lack of variability in the surfaces one plays on in these sports. Think of track and field, tennis, basketball, soccer, football, and the list goes on. All the courts, pitches, tracks, and arenas are perfectly leveled ground, which lacks variability. So again, any variation from this norm, like let's say running a trail, may leave one vulnerable to ankle sprains due to one's lack of preparedness to running on anything other than perfectly level ground. I guess it is no surprise then that world record marathon runner Elliot Kipchoge spends a great portion of his training off-road. Finally, to take Dr. Francis's last point, 
One then sticks one's perfectly engineered foot and ankle made up of 26 bones, 33 joints, and over 100 muscles and pieces of connective tissue, all meant to move the foot across the full spectrum of human motion into a regular shoe, which is stiff, built up with arch support, and does not allow freedom of motion. The consequence, unfortunately, is that movement variability is then lowered even further. Well, with this much manipulation and control, it's no wonder our bodies break down as soon as they are pushed even slightly out of their comfort zones. And this is where the mismatch between evolutionary biology and cultural evolution, as presented by Dr. Francis, can now be understood. But fortunately, each one of these issues can be minimized in the following ways. The first step is to introduce other sports into your routine. So if you are a track and field runner, for example, playing a bit of tennis or basketball here and there can get you not just running in a straight line at a constant pace, but shuffling side to side, changing direction and varying your running pace. This variability alone can go a long way towards stimulating and strengthening your ankles and feet musculature. The next step is to exercise on various terrains and surfaces. So running on grass, sand, uphill, downhill, and on trails can all add diversity to your training. However, a quick disclaimer here. Introducing any new variable into your training, such as surface variation, needs to occur slowly. I've personally made the mistake of deciding to do a mountainous trail run after being restricted to road running for a few months, only to then sprain my ankle two kilometers into the trail. What I should have done is walk the trail a few times, then introduced a few interval runs, and finally ramped up the volume as I got used to the terrain. I guess sometimes we need to learn lessons the hard way. However, after watching this video, you have no excuses. Moving on to the next step, which is by far the lowest hanging fruit on this tree and something anyone can do immediately, and that is to train barefoot and or substitute regular shoes for barefoot style shoes. As Dr. Francis mentioned in our interview, modern footwear has a highly supportive and regular interior, which acts as a barrier between you and the ground, thereby disconnecting you from feeling and reacting to the little diversity that is left in our modern environment. So in our interview with Dr. Francis, which will be linked down below, he mentions that by wearing minimalist footwear, which is thin and flexible, one starts feeling and responding to the ground again. He gives the practical example of walking over the reflective blocks on a zebra crossing. While a thick layer of EVA foam does little to send sensory information to the brain and ankle about this obstacle in the road, barefoot shoes allow these signals to be transmitted naturally. Remember, we communicate with the terrain through our feet, which are the only contact points we have with the ground during bipedal movements. Therefore, we need to ensure that the feet have enough ground feel to sense everything. In this way, our body, including our supportive structures around our ankles, can then respond appropriately. These findings have been validated in several studies. One such study, which got me really excited because it was conducted in my homeland, South Africa, took high-level netball players who were randomly split into two groups after testing their ankle stability, agility, and speed. One group then performed an eight-week training program barefoot, while the other group performed the same program wearing regular training shoes. At the end of the intervention, ankle stability, agility, and speed were retested for both groups. Astonishingly, the barefoot group improved almost two times more than the shoe wearing group in most of the tests. So how cool is that? The same program just done without shoes yielded almost double the positive results. However, there is another disclaimer here. The authors of the study did an important thing. They didn't throw their subjects straight into the deep end by making them train exclusively barefoot from day one. Instead, they allowed only five minutes of barefoot exercise in session one and then slowly ramped up the time until the athletes were doing full training sessions barefoot by week eight. By having the smart transition period, the researchers managed to prevent any of their netball players from getting injured, which is the only real risk one has when first starting to train barefoot. This is the main reason for which we have developed the Barefoot Shoe Transition Program, which is designed to help someone carefully adjust to running barefoot or in barefoot shoes using specific supplementary exercises and smart programming. You can find links to this program below. 
Anyway, now we get to the most exciting portion of this video. So stay tuned to the end because I'm gonna show you how to make your own ankle strengthening exercise devices. You see, through all my research, I found a method of incorporating all three ankle strengthening principles mentioned in this video, namely movement variation, surface variation, and barefoot movement into one training protocol, which can be done in the comfort of your own home. It's called wobble board or balance board training. What it essentially entails is placing a wooden board on top of a yoga block or pipe on which you have to stabilize and balance yourself. Unlike many other lower limb exercises, balanced training is performed in weight-bearing positions, which are excellent for improving ankle stability. It is no wonder then that in a study in which a group of volleyball players participated in a balance board exercise intervention, they incurred significantly fewer ankle injuries than the group that had done no balance board training. In fact, several studies have shown that balance board training does not only improve static and dynamic balance, but also reduces the risk of incurring sports injuries. Furthermore, balance and coordination training has been shown to provide improvements in case cases of functional ankle instability and excessively pronated flat feet. Great, so it is obviously a useful tool, but there is just one problem. These balance boards are pretty expensive and it might be difficult to get them shipped to your country because they are relatively large. So I took matters into my own hands. I acquired a cheap plank and screwed two smaller planks on either side of it. These smaller bits act as safety stoppers when I'm on the roller. I then used my existing foam roller and yoga block to balance on. As an alternative to the foam roller, I got my hands on a PVC water pipe offcut. Because there was no rubber on the PVC, it tended to slide about on the floor, which was hazardous for me while standing on top of it. A simple fix is to just lay a rubber gym mat underneath or use it on a carpet. There you go, for a fraction of the cost, you can make a basic DIY balance board. But I didn't stop there. I thought if this was so easy to make, what other apparatus can I build to strengthen my ankles? Naturally, I made a balancing beam. This beam is so simple. It is just made up of heavy duty PVC water pipe, which can be found everywhere in the world and very cheaply too. The build consists of one long piece for the cross beam, four shorter pieces for the feet, two even smaller pieces for the uprights, two T pieces for supports, two elbow joints to connect everything together and four end caps to finish it off. Balance beam training is super useful for single leg balance and stability, which has been found to be a problem for those who have weak ankles and are prone to getting ankle sprains. Single leg stability work is also essential for all activities that involve running because the running motion is made up of a continuous sequence of single leg supports. Anyways, I'm going to leave you with a clip of me working on my ankle strength using our balance board and beam. In our next video, we're going to expand on this topic and include more ways to strengthen your ankles. So subscribe and hit that notification bell as to not miss out on that one. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Chris. And until next time, please hit that like button. I mean, cheers.